Uh, we'll go to our one last speaker before lunch. Um, this is Ed Stanton uh, from the Siskiyou Land Trust going to be talking to us about agricultural conservation easements. All right, let me get this all pulled up. All right, here we go. All right, good morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. So today I'm gonna have you take off your neoprenes and hang them up to dry for a bit and pull you up out of the groundwater. And we're gonna step back and look at conservation easements. And we're gonna step back far enough that you're actually gonna be able to see into the future. And we're gonna describe the, what the Siskiyou Land Trust is doing with conservation easements in, in the mid Klamath watershed uh, for the conservation of fish and wildlife habitat. I first want to help you understand what is a land trust and what do we do as a land trust. So we are a nonprofit organization. We're non-advocacy uh, and we're also um, non-governmental. And we're land trusts are established for the purpose of conserving pub, uh, private land for public benefit. And we act as facilitators. So we have uh, public policy out there already that's established. And then we have landowners that are trying to achieve something on their land. And we come in and try to solve a solution for the two of them together and, and achieve whatever this conservation goal is on this landscape. And we primarily are doing this through the protection of land. Sometimes we own the land, but mostly what we do is put a conservation easement on land that someone else owns. And then the land trust responsibility is to monitor that conservation easement and that the landowner is complying with the terms of that conservation easement and that those natural resources that are being protected by the easement are in fact still staying there through time. And we're funded through memberships, through donations. Our, our land purchases are, are primarily funded through public grants. And then um, we are funded partially as well through the um, interest that's earned from our investment accounts. So before you can really understand what a conservation easement is, it's important that you understand what it is to own land. What does that actually mean? And so when you own a piece of land, what comes with that is a bundle of rights. And you can think of this as like a bundle of sticks or maybe a, a binder uh, with lay layers of leaves of uh, sheets of pages in it, with each sheet in that binder or each stick in that bundle being a separate right that you possess as the owner of that land. So now you have that bundle of sticks and some of the things that you see out here in our landscape that are taking place are, um, that are threatening the, the resources that we're talking about this week are sometimes these ranches are being chopped up, right? And so we can, no, you can just keep remove, a, remove a stick and we can sell off a piece of the property or we can chop up the ranch into a bunch of 80 acre pieces and build a bunch of houses and sell them all off. And in the end, you still have no ranch at the end. Or you can retain the ownership of your whole property and you can change the shape of that stick. You can change the land use itself. And so right out here on Oberlin on the way in, you could see a, uh, what was an open field, open pasture is now a, a vineyard. And you're, we're seeing more and more of that. And that's much more intensive agriculture, requires much more water than what's currently taking place out there. Now other farmers might see that, uh, you know, growing cows is really hard work, but maybe someone wants to come in and put a, a solar array on my farm and I can generate income off of the electricity generated out there instead of off of the cows. But either way, you're going to wind up with some land that's a little less attractive to fish and wildlife. There are other ways that you can have sticks removed from your bundle. You, there are eminent domain opportunities for roads to be constructed through your property. Uh, an airport may be constructed nearby and they take property rights away from above the land. Uh, there may be someone that owns the mineral rights below your land. 
you may sell your timber rights or you may grant someone access to your property legally to hunt on your land or maybe a, a trail that cuts through your property to reach some public land on the other side. So a conservation easement is, is similar to these later elements. It's a permanent encumbrance on your privately owned land. But rather than actually being a stick in itself, I think of it more like you're breaking that stick in a piece in half where the landowner is responsible for part of that re resource. And then the land trust is partially responsible for that resource as well. And what you see in this diagram is a, a, a ranch at the lower left where uh, the farmer can still do the ranching, still do the farming, but then in the riparian zone that crosses through that ranch, there is some resources that are shared by the land trust to ensure that those resources stay there through through time. And a, an easement is perpetual. It stays with the land. It goes beyond the current landowner. It goes into all future landowners into perpetuity. And there are a variety of types of conservation easements and the types that the land trust, that Siskiyou Land Trust uses uh, primarily are agricultural conservation easements for the open space, protecting the open space and the agricultural activities that are on there. So we're not interested in removing people from the land and we're not interested in removing economic productivity from the land. What we're interested in removing from the land is the risk to those natural resources that are there the most critical resources. Some of those critical resources might be the river itself or the riparian woodland uh, adjacent to it or the wet meadows in your forest. And so we have um, uh, wetland conservation easements and riparian corridor conservation easements. You might be familiar with the wetland reserve system through the Natural Resources Conservation Service. And another type of conservation easement that Siskiyou Land Trust uses frequently is a forest conservation easement. Now, the one depicted here is actually in the upper Sacramento watershed. And this one's a little different in that the land trust owns the land and Cal Fire actually holds the conservation easement on this property. But here, what we're trying to do is protect um, the values that come with that forest at the wildland urban interface, but also we want to manage that forest as a demonstration forest to reduce the fuel loading so that we can help protect the urbanized area along the I-5 corridor here at that interface between where you have development and then behind us, which we abut uh, national forest land. And so there are a variety of ways uh, you can do use a conservation easement to protect these resources. But the resources are really site dependent. So every property will have different elements on it that we want to see conserved. It might be wildlife migration corridors, it might be mountain meadows or aspen groves or oak woodlands, or what we're talking about here, the salmon in the, in the streams. And so when a deed of conservation easement is actually signed and recorded at the county, what is taking place is the landowner still retains all of those rights of that land, that whole bundle of sticks, excluding that stick that is shared with the land trust itself. And at the same time, the landowner is accepting then some responsibility, the responsibility to manage that land to ensure that those conservation values remain with that land. So it's not just being managed for cattle or for timber, it's also being managed for those wildlife and fish resources. The land trust by entering into this agreement is then accepting the responsibility to monitor that landowner's compliance with the terms of the easement and to ensure that those conservation values remain in that on that property through time. And if something goes wrong, the land trust then has the authority to defend those conservation values and take that all the way to civil court if necessary. So now with that, you know more about real estate than almost any real estate agent you will encounter. So let's see how this looks on the ground when you actually implement this. Here's an example in Scott River Valley. The Scott River is on the left-hand side. Uh, and the green area is in and around the flood zone. And each color depicts a different type of agriculture that is allowed to be done on that property. 
And in fact, this is five conservation easements. So this is blended together, five conservation easements, but creating a land management zoning throughout roughly 6,000 acres of land. And in the green area, you can see the sinuous nature of the, of the river here. And the easement contemplates that that river will move through time. And that agriculture that's taking place nearest the river in the floodplain is of such that it will be the least likely to cause sedimentation to go into the river, uh, but also enables that river to move. And then the riparian habitat would move with it. And then as you get up into the orange zone, you have least lower, fewer and fewer restrictions on land use because you're going to have lower and lower impact on the water resources down in the river area. But you're going to be protecting that wide open space that allows large animals like elk and bears and wolves to move through. In addition, you can see the small red areas like here. Uh, this is, oops, that's a building uh envelope and so like i said we don't try to remove people from the land we actually set aside areas where they can build a residential site worker housing ranch headquarters um, but still agriculture can take place on the land now if you zoom out a little bit further in the upper center in this map is the property that we just looked at in color but now, instead of just looking at 6,000 acres, we're looking at more than 25,000 acres of conservation easement on that same landscape here. We have a 17,000 acre easement to the right uh, that's not our land trust. It's another land trust that holds that conservation easement. But now we're working with these adjacent landowners to the other ranch I showed you. And now you can see how if you start getting both sides of the river and up and down that river, you could really start to have big impacts on how that river can behave long into the future, not just now, not just not tomorrow's uh, water quality data, but 50 years from now and 100 years from now, this will still all be wide open space. Here's an example in the Shasta Valley where a landowner approached us uh, after entering into the Safe Harbor Agreement. Uh, they approached us, and this is a good example of how the land trust sees a landscape and a property when it comes to when a landowner comes to us with interest in a conservation easement. So we see this landowner has already been very active in, in doing conservation uh, for the river per values. Then we also look at the, the shaded dark green or, or light solid green areas. They're state wildlife areas. And so we see this ranch being in between two existing state wildlife areas and other cattle ranches in, in the proximity. And we can envision being able to protect and ensure that those open ranch, those ranches remain as open space and that that river remains protected, at least on one side, and that the groundwater basin that's below all of this is, is protected as well long into the future. And that radius, that circle there is a five mile radius from the town of Grenada, which is an I-5 interstate exchange. And you can see around the perimeter of that how much parcelization has already taken place on this agricultural land. And that is your future in these valleys. You will see this continue to get chopped up. You will see this get developed. You will not be seeing as much agriculture out here. And you will have much, much, much harder time protecting these fish without this wide open space. And so this is why we are out here trying to work in this landscape. Now you zoom back a little bit further and you can see these similar types of opportunities lie all over the landscape here. We, the yellow here are existing conserved lands and the red areas are potential areas where if a landowner in those spots came to us and said, we are interested in a conservation easement, we can see why we would want to do that. We can see in the Scott area, uh, in the Aetna area, how we might be able to protect some of those, excuse me, um, uh, tributaries of the Scott River that come out of the hills where we already have conserved land. Uh, up here in the Mount Shasta weed area, uh, there are plenty of opportunities to protect the watershed up above Lake Shastina and wildlife corridors moving uh, in and around the I-5 corridor. Similarly, um, 
along the river when the dams are coming out, there are opportunities to close in some of that checkerboarding and get some more consistent land management across ownerships so that the wildlife don't bump into fences and entirely different management regimes on the other side. And just a quick blurb on what we're doing next is uh, we did recently receive an award from Natural Resources Conservation Services Regional Conservation Partnership Program, which is in which we were awarded roughly half of the funds that we will need to do five more agriculture conservation easements in this landscape with the goal of protecting at least 5,000 acres of agriculture land with these types of resources on them uh, and to protect at least 50 acres of riparian woodland and two miles of streams occupied by coho salmon. Hopefully that got us back a little bit closer to time. Oh, don't worry about time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you. All right. Yeah. All right. There are a few questions. Here. Um, there are a few questions in the chat. I'm going to leave your talk up here for now, just in case we need to reference back. Um, is there somewhere where we can see the exact terms of easements you create from Dave Webb? So the conservation easements that have already been recorded are, you can actually go to the county and get copies of them. They're all public record. Uh, if you contact Kathleen Hitt, our executive director, or myself, uh, about a specific conservation easement, because it is a pub public document, we can share that with you. Um, and there was uh, one more. Um, uh, how do you vet worthiness, lawfulness of participants when making considerations to work with them? And I'm not going to name the names that are on there. Try to read that closer. Uh, I'm not worried about the name. Of the <laughs> how do you vet worthy? Okay. So, um, well, lawfulness, I don't know about that. What we do is, this is a real estate transaction, so we do our real estate due diligence. We verify that the landowner is the actual landowner and has a right to sell us this conservation easement. That's one of the most critical things. And as I mentioned uh, in some of the maps, we want to work with landowners that are, have already been actively involved in good conservation efforts. Uh, if you're antagonistic to conservation, we may have difficulty working with it, we're not going to say no, because you may have resources that are just so valuable that your personality is not an issue here, because we are not an advocate, an advocacy organization. We're really looking out for the resources that the public has determined are important. Uh, and so we do the vetting that way. We have a whole suite of things that we look at. What are the, con what's the connectivity to existing conserved land? What are the natural resources that are present on the property? Um, is the landowner truly interested in doing this? And are there public uh, programs out there that we think we can access funding to conclude, to reach a successful project? So those are the types of things we look at. Selection, yeah, we have some selection criteria that we go through. And we actually have a, a board of directors and a subcommittee from that board uh, that vets each property individually, and we go through a scoring process. Great. All right. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat. Uh, thank you, Ed. That was great. Um, we have now come to the time of lunch. So um, we are planning on being back here at uh, 1 p.m. Oh, uh, Conrad, did you have a question? If it's not too late. Uh, yeah, sure. Go for it. Mm -hmm. Sorry, we've heard about different mechanisms to restore flows, regulatory and voluntary. It seems to me one of the best voluntary uh, possibilities to get water and stream would be to permanently dedicate water and stream in association with land acquisitions. Uh, so I guess I'm wondering why the Siskiyou Land Trust does not do that and so few land trusts do that and what it might take to convince them. Um, my conclusion thus far, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the only real way to convince land trust to do it is to compel the funders that give them money to do it, but I'm open to suggestions because, uh, I mean, we're either going to do it regulatorily sure. or voluntarily, but there's a lot, of, there's a huge missed opportunity. So I'm going to let Kathleen hit, answer that because she's actually working on something just like that right now. Conrad, I think that's And I'll that's preface a... it with permanent. I'll say permanent, not temporary. Go ahead. Sure. And I'd say, Conrad, that's a great question, and it's a complex one with lots of nuance. Um, both Scott and Shasta Valleys have water trusts or 
entities that function as a water trust for in-stream dedications. And so Siskiyou Land Trust, with our focus on land, looks to coordinate with our partners and be complementary. And so for a long time, I'd say we actually partner with a whole lot of folks in our conservation easements. I'd say almost probably all of them actually that dedicate water in stream um, consistently with some, whether it's the mechanisms on the Shasta or the Scott River Water Trust. So that is actually something that rises a project, raises a project up to the top of our list for conservation um, partners. And then when it comes to the question of what about a permanent dedication, um, we have actually worked with um, a conservation easement that included that. I'd say all of our agricultural easements uh, actually adjust what this what our state funding partners have in there for the water rights. We always make sure that the water rights can be dedicated in streams seasonally, or they can be um, dedicated permanently so long as there's a balance, recognizing that it's not either or. We think it's important to manage both. And so that door is open. Um, Siskiyou Land Trust is looking into filling that gap because some of our water um, transaction entities may not be set up for long-term relationships. I think something Ed brought forward is easements are forever. The land trust horizon is forever. That's a long time for planning for a nonprofit. And so we have a stewardship fund that we've been raising over the years and still are building our endowment. And the intention is to see how can we partner in that way. And so we haven't actually closed the door on that. We're stepping into it, but water transactions are very different than land transactions. They're not real estate, real estate laws, real estate law, water laws, water law. So they, there's obviously overlap, but they're very nuanced and very technical, both in the realm of paper rights versus what's in the water. That's where our technical, um, partners come into play, whether it's the Water Trust or the RCD or the Watershed Council, to know where it's really effective. And then I think it's that bigger conversation of us showing up here today to go, okay, we're in this conversation and that takes capacity. So as the land trust is actually growing up and growing into itself, we are looking to raise that $25 million endowment to help us out in perpetuity. We're looking to boost our capacity to be able to partner in those ways. And so I'd say we're stepping into that and um, wanting to do that thoughtfully and well. And so that, again, takes a technical understanding, it takes a legal understanding, and it takes really partnering with all of the organizations that are out there, entities, um, whether it's tribes, individual, private landowners, and the like. And so, again, I'd say we are actually open to that, and we're we're moving in that direction and wanting to do that really thoughtfully. So, thanks for asking. Okay, uh, just a parting thought before lunch: most of the transactions have been passive, uh, permissive, or temporary, not permanent. So, I suggest to everyone that to start considering permanent dedications and association with land acquisitions. Um, since we're still waiting for our, our lunch to arrive, I, there is one more question in the chat. Um, uh, at, uh, do you consult with other NGOs, agencies, and tribes to get input on resource values and restoration potential when negotiating easements? Yes, yes, and yes. Um, we really, our, our program is really driven by the state policies and programs that are already out there. Uh, so we, when we're writing a grant proposal, we're just digging into existing policy to argue why this is a good project. Uh, and then uh, our current funding, the uh, Natural Resources Conservation Program, is just that. It's a partnership program. Although in this landscape, there aren't as many partners that do the type of work that we do. So we don't have as many that we can directly partner with. But we do, uh, all, almost all of our landowners are working with other NGOs like the watershed associate, uh, the, the watershed councils, or the RCDs, or NRCS to get conservation work done on their land. All right, great. Well, that was some nice, good, productive conversation. Um, so, thanks again for all the speakers so far this morning. We are going to take a break for lunch.